I'm usually pretty dismissive of reality TV, but I'd be lying if I didn't admit that The Traitors is one of the most captivating shows on television right now. As each episode passes, the stakes only get higher, as the social ties grow stronger and the psychological strategies become dirtier. The basic premise is that roughly 20 contestants enter a castle to play a murder mystery game. Each day, they all perform group tasks to generate prize money, which will be won by the final four contestants at the end of the show. But hidden amongst them are at least three traitors, who meet in secret every night to eliminate one player from the game and form psychological strategies to employ the next day. After the group task, everyone meets at the round table to cast aspersions as to who might be the traitor, and the players all openly vote to banish one contestant from the game, who then reveals if they were in fact a faithful or a traitor. When the show ends, if there are only faithfuls remaining, they split the prize pot amongst each other, but if there are any traitors remaining, they steal all the prize money for themselves. Naturally, the show has attracted some criticism for rewarding the ability to lie and manipulate, as that could set a bad example for the viewers at home, as the only way to win the show as a traitor is to exploit your fellow contestants' trust. But the participants do know it's a game, they know what they're signing up for, making this no different to a game of poker or the end of Golden Balls. Leanne, you've stolen all the money! And perhaps the real reason for the show's unprecedented levels of success is that viewers at home feel the need to educate themselves on the realities of manipulation now more than ever. Given we live in the age of misinformation, where we're unsure what sources to trust and who may be pulling our strings, The Traitors essentially functions as a crash course in the subtleties of deception, where you can watch people plot how to orchestrate narratives around their fellow contestants to lead them to false conclusions. We may all like to believe that we would be able to spot someone manipulating us, but The Traitors highlights how much our personal biases interfere with our ability to detect deceit. On paper, being a traitor is a massive advantage, as you can't be killed off in the night and you get to meet and conspire with your fellow traitors. But it's also a heavy emotional burden to carry, as whether you win or lose, you will have to reveal to your fellow contestants that you were lying and cheating the whole time, making the game a fascinating social experiment about how much we value our interpersonal relationships. But in a game of such chance and unpredictability, how do you win the traitors, either as a traitor or as a faithful? Let's take a deeper look at what the first two seasons of the UK and US versions of the show have taught us so far. Although the longer the show runs, there's no doubt that players will have to switch it up and play it every which way to out-strategize their opponents. Now, if you haven't watched the show, I thoroughly recommend you do, especially before continuing this video, as there will be spoilers for the first two seasons of the UK Traders on BBC and the first season and a half of the US Traders, which is currently streaming on Peacock. Let's start with how to win this game as a traitor. The first key is to sit back and listen. Listening is one of the most important skills as a traitor, as by hearing who the other contestants suspect, it allows you to formulate plans around those biases. The bigger personalities in the room won't be able to resist vocalising their every suspicion, and given their initial ideas are all probably wrong, sit back and listen so that they can start creating enemies and conflicts within the group, which can all serve as narratives for you to play with later. Which leads into the next point, don't stir, confirm. Generally, when someone sees you stirring the pot, it makes you a suspect unless you have valuable evidence to work with. Remember that whenever you wrongly accuse someone in the room, that person is naturally going to assume you might be a traitor, and anyone who likes them more might suddenly turn against you. Therefore, you cannot be seen leading the charge against someone you know is a faithful, as that will be a bad look for you when they reveal the truth. Instead, you need to let someone else throw out the wrong idea and then confirm their suspicion back to them. Like here, notice how the traitor Alyssa lets Aaron throw out the bigger idea and then she just subtly backs it. But Alex should also just be the traitor and just put herself in there just to defend this herself. Is my, yeah. Like it's simple as that. But she intelligently ensures she doesn't take up too much of the airtime so that Aaron gets the credit for promoting the wrong idea. We see Alyssa do this again, when Theo suggests Aaron was right for writing down a different wrong name than everyone else. I think the only person that got it right last night was Aaron. Do you know what? I was quite I respected him. Yep. Yeah. yeah, from not actually following like a sheep. This is subtle brilliance from Alyssa, as she lets Theo lead the thought and John finish the thought, but she tactically ties their thoughts together under the label of respect to cement the narrative. 
Respect is an emotional word that elevates the concept in both their minds. So now if they want to be respected too, they should vote for Imran. By confirming the other player's bias like this, you enable them to fantasize that they might be the chosen ones seeing the real truth. They might even believe that they're about to crush this game, but really you're encouraging them to run in the wrong direction. If you're trustworthy and tactical enough, you can literally put words in other players' mouths and later watch them parrot your arguments for you. We either get a traitor or it's just a bad faithful, so at the end of the day, not losing it's, either way. it's not losing. I don't think you are a traitor. I think you're a bad faithful, to be honest. The key is that you do have to play it a bit dumb. If the other contestants think you're cool, calm, collected, and calculating, then you're more likely to be banished, as the more the traitors win, the more they'll turn on the most likely person to be masterminding their demise. So you need to fly under the radar. For instance, Amanda played an amazing game in the UK's first season, by being an earthy Welsh mother figure who didn't seem like she had a very clear strategy in mind. I honestly think it's like a roulette game. <laughs> they know who they are, yes, and they're just going yes. like that. Yeah. This throws the others off the scent and also makes everyone less likely to condemn Amanda for voting for the wrong person, as it's not personal, she's just randomly guessing. Another approach is being very emotionally transparent, like Wilfred. Although this can backfire from pouring the emotions on too thick when someone you've only known for two days gets kicked off, generally people who seem very emotional are not assumed to be very calculating or even particularly rational. They fall into the feeling category more than the thinking category. So by delivering these big exaggerated reactions and always having your emotions right on the surface, people feel like they're getting a good read on you and sort of think you're a little bit incapable of outsmarting them. Being able to emotionally outpour at a moment's notice is also a very useful skill in case you're under fire and need to turn the tables by playing the victim. Naturally, once other faithful see you're hurt, someone will rush to your aid to comfort you, which makes the accuser look like the bad guy and communicates to the onlookers that you do have the support of others in the room. But if you are going to accuse someone, don't manufacture evidence. Repeat it. This should be based on evidence. Faithfuls innocently like to believe that they're following the evidence, as if this is a court system. But the truth is that in the castle, there's very little evidence to go off, except other people's suspicions and tiny hunches here and there. So a traitor should always encourage the others to follow evidence, as they can then influence how important that alleged evidence seems at any point in time. If you're caught making up a lie that no one else can verify, you'll be exposed and banished. But as long as you have a piece of evidence guiding your thinking, then others will join you and share in the blame. For example, Amanda would usually not turn on anyone, but then when she discovers Maddie kept a secret that she has worked as an actor before, she repeats this evidence to anyone that will hear it, as if this is groundbreaking news that changes everything. The only thing is the acting with you. Because yeah. she's, oh, yeah, so. she's been in EastEnders, she's been in Casualty. She's been in EastEnders, she's been in Casualty, she's been in the theatre. If players were thinking clearly, they would see that Maddie choosing to admit that she acted before is a symptom of honesty, as she's needlessly putting herself under scrutiny. But because they like Amanda, and Amanda seems to find it a bigger deal, they now mirror her and pick up on the idea even more like a social contagion. When it comes to who to eliminate from the game at night, kill strategically. This is not a time to settle old scores. You always need to think two steps ahead of the group and control the narrative. As a traitor, you actually get to choose where the group is most likely to look next, as faithfuls usually naively follow the breadcrumbs you've left out for them, as that's the only evidence they have. This makes them feel like it's all making sense, but they're actually falling right into your plan. If one contestant had a petty squabble the day before, then eliminate the squabbler to misdirect the attention away from you and frame the other player as the traitor instead. But if someone is always stirring the pot and has created multiple enemies, leave them in the game, as the most aggressive contestants tend to banish themselves. Don't take stupid risks like killing players who might have a shield, do take out players that no one else will banish, and always break apart clicks, as once there are groups of three or four people, they could randomly turn on you at any time. Or if someone seems too smart and has yet to put the group's attention on you, it's safest to eliminate them before the heat gets turned up. This leads directly into the next point, avoid the limelight. 
If the UK's second season's Paul taught us anything, it's that hiding in plain sight eventually catches up with you. It must be very different to be in the room with Paul than watching him on screen, as his vacant eye-bluffing and pantomime levels of overacting never pass the sniff test for me. Yet the other contestants somehow bought it hook, line, and sinker, and he was considered the most popular player. But he clearly flew too close to the sun by keeping the limelight on himself. He was everywhere. He willingly placed himself in the dungeon, repeatedly confronted the few people that suspected him too openly, and kept taking too much credit for kicking out the other traitors. In fellow traitor Harry's words, he was just doing too much. While being popular is a good strategy, if you try to double or triple bluff constantly, people will eventually grow suspicious of how you're still in the game, as surely the traitors would have killed you off for being too influential. Therefore, flying somewhat under the radar is safer than hiding in plain sight. The smart play is to not put yourself on trial or in the dungeon, as the group usually suspects there's at least one bluffing traitor on that list, so banishes one of them. And if you are told to murder in plain sight, you're wiser to let a different traitor do it, as it usually comes back to bite you. If and when you are accused, you need to have convincing answers already prepared. Don't let yourself be blindsided, a weak traitor is easy to spot. For example, in the UK's second season, we see Ash panic in the very first episode when Sonya jokingly asks if she's a traitor and starts pretending not to be able to hear her, instead of just answering normally. She then rambles at the round table and manages to contradict herself within 10 seconds. Or in the US's second season, Dan arrogantly perceives himself as a great traitor for flying so far under the radar, but quickly gets called out for being too quiet. And when asked to share his suspicions, he embarrassingly refuses to offer up a single suggestion. But you've never suspected no, anybody of anything? I think I'm starting to, but I definitely don't want to say You don't it. want to show your cards yet? By not committing to even one possible name, he's demonstrating that he's never even begun considering who could be a traitor, because he is one. He's playing it so safe that he's actually giving his game away. This leads to the round table, which is really where the game is won and lost, as it functions like a Salem witch trial. Players tend to vote based on recency bias, and their mind can be swayed so quickly by a single slip-up. For this reason, it's wisest not to dominate the headlines of your fellow voter's imagination. When you are accused, remain calm. Don't get too defensive and subtly minimize the attention you're receiving. Speak less, not more. Like, energy has changed. I, I feel like there's like a weight on you. Let's look at how the faithful Jazz executes this plan when the traitor Paul tries to put the pressure on him. Fair point, fair point. Do you want to defend what you're saying? Defend yourself for? Not really. Yeah. Yeah. I don't think um, there's the need to. This may seem avoidant, but the longer you're under the spotlight, the longer the players' minds are focused on you. And when they come to write a name on the board, they won't be able to get your name out of their head, as they feel as if you're the person they remember suspecting the most. So you're better off giving a short answer that nips it in the bud, and then letting the mob move on to someone else as the second anyone else makes a mistake, everyone will forget all about you. The worst thing you can do is take it personally, and start accusing multiple people at the table, as every time you falsely accuse someone else, you convert them to voting against you. If you have to name someone else, pick someone the group already suspects. Don't create multiple enemies at once. As generally speaking, contestants struggle to differentiate between people they personally dislike and people they don't trust, those lines blur easily, so it's best not to piss people off, like the faithful Rachel foolishly did in the first season of the US Traitors, when she called everyone at the table an idiot and proceeded to make snarky remarks as they each voted her out one by one. I voted for you, Rachel. Oh, shocker. You voted me out because you're a traitor and you need someone to vote out. Got it. The smart way to play it is to always couch your language, throw out an accusation and soften the blow by suggesting you're not certain about what you're saying. Heated rivalries may make for good TV, but they're a terrible strategy for any traitor, as if you roll around in the muck long enough, you're going to get dirty. Therefore, you should never push too hard on a faithful, or you risk becoming the key name associated with booting that innocent player out. It's better if someone else gets the credit for the false accusation, and you can be the second or third player hopping on board. That way, you can always claim you foolishly followed the herd against your better judgement. 
if two faithfuls start accusing each other, sit back and let them go at it, as they're stupidly stealing the spotlight, and in the end, you'll likely get two for the price of one. As once one innocent faithful is banished, the group is likely going to turn on the other and banish them next, while the real culprits can hide in the shadows. We saw Harry execute this plan perfectly in the UK's second season, when he got the shield. He framed the narrative that only the players on the other team who didn't know he had a shield would have tried to kill him, when in reality he recruited Ross that night. Therefore, after Ross goes, Jasmine and Evie are left behind as the two prime suspects, and now have no choice but to target each other. And once one is banished incorrectly, the group feels as if they must banish the other to close the loop. They can't feel safe until Harry's false narrative is put to rest. The only time a traitor should truly commit to an accusation is when they're knocking out a fellow traitor, as that way they get the credit. The problem with turning on your fellow traitors is that if you don't do it first, then it will be done to you when the time is right. If everyone is turning against your teammate, then you need to vote them out in order to look innocent. And if you can somehow flip it and be the one leading the charge, then you'll double your power levels, as the faithfuls will trust you more than ever. But once you go for a traitor, you have to finish the job. Otherwise, you'll awkwardly have to face them later that night, or risk them turning on you. It's a high-risk, all-or-nothing move. We see this in the UK's second season, when Harry, Paul and Miles all turn against Ash at once. They haven't had a chance to communicate with each other, but Harry leads the charge by openly accusing her first, which sends the signal to his fellow traitors, Miles and Paul. Paul quickly joins in to throw some dirt, but then the conversation moves away from Ash and onto another player for a prolonged period of time. So they now risk someone else stealing the spotlight and squandering their opportunity. So check out how Miles beautifully pulls the attention back onto Ash, but not by offering his opinion, but simply unlocking someone else's. I was ask you, Andrew, the, the name that you're, you put forward yesterday, yeah. I just wanted to know where that's come from. That was all because so I spent the time with that, but obviously it's Ash. So Miles makes Andrew do his dirty work for him by putting Ash back under scrutiny, and then notice how he tactically steps back and softens his accusation to ensure his hands are clean. It's only because I am I'm back to ground zero, I have no idea. In a way, he's connivingly creating a dynamic where he and Andrew are having a private conversation in public about Ash, but he's never once personally accusing her. By taking this approach, there's no head-to-head -head conflict, so he doesn't give her the opportunity to damage his reputation. The best way to prevent a traitor from turning on you first is to play to their ego and let them believe that they're the one leading the group, as if they perceive themselves to be in control, they'll never see your betrayal coming. The difficulty is that after openly killing off other traitors and taking the credit, your new recruits aren't going to trust you, as they've seen what you did to your last teammates. If you are a newly recruited traitor, and if you have already been suspected by the group, they're likely using you as a scapegoat, in which case you should probably figure out who the weakest traitor is and unexpectedly turn on them instantly to take the attention off yourself and level the playing field with the remaining traitor. When it comes to winning the money at the end, you likely need a second traitor that you can throw to the wolves, as the final four typically won't vote to end the game until they feel they found at least one more traitor. You need the traitor narrative to be over so that they can feel they've finished the game and are now safe. If you suspect that anyone is going to vote to banish again, you need to do the same, as only the traitors are incentivized for the game to end, and by being the only one to vote to end, you now stand out as the prime suspect. In essence, at this stage of the game, voting to banish makes you look more like a faithful. But if there are still two traitors remaining and you want to steal the money for yourself, then if they vote to end and you vote to banish, you can convince the other faithfuls that a true traitor would just vote to end the game. And once they eliminate your fellow traitor, they will trust you more than ever and end the game with you, giving you all the money instead of having to split it 50-50. But be careful, as it's not uncommon for the last traitor to be voted out to leave a parting gift and cast aspersions on you by writing your name as their final vote. This makes it harder for the remaining faithfuls to end the game with an active risk still present. Which leads to the final key strategy, 
In order to win the traitors as a traitor, you must befriend a faithful closely. Someone that will vouch for you no matter what. Someone that when the time comes and there are only three of you left, even if they think you're both faithful, will choose to split the money with you instead of the other finalist. I do trust Will completely. I can't second guess that now because I've trusted him all the way through. This is the darkest aspect of the game, because The Traitors is really about social trust, how real your connection and friendship truly is. And the more time you spend together, the more of a relationship is built and the more clouded your judgement becomes. You begin to forget that it is just a game, as it's now really about what this prize money could do to help your fellow friends. So if you are in it to win it, just like in life, you can't do it alone. You need other people's support. You cannot stick to yourself, you cannot be too shy, you cannot be too cold. You have to be open and willing to share your personality with the group. But you also need to find that one person that will carry you with them to the end and essentially let you take the money from them. But those are just the ways to win the game as a traitor, how about as a faithful? Although you're initially at a numerical advantage, there are so many ways to lose as a faithful. If you're too loud, the group might vote you out. If you're too quiet, the traitors might decide to kill you off. You need to somehow strike a balance between being useful to the traitors and useful to the faithful. For starters, it's best not to throw out every suspicion you have right away. By being too vocal, you either risk wrongly accusing faithfuls and being banished, or correctly accusing traitors, and if you haven't got the numbers to back your theory yet, then you'll quickly be killed off. You have to play it quite carefully. If you know somebody's a traitor, if you go all guns blazing, you end up being a target. See what ideas other players have, and then observe who is speaking up, when, and how much. While it may be nice for your ego to come out as the chief detective, the behavioural expert who can sniff out the truth, all you're doing is putting a target on your back. But by seeming a little more malleable, the game players, strategists and traitors will all value coming to you, as you make them feel validated for their theories. As tempting as it feels at the time, as they are dominating headlines, don't always vote out the most antagonistic player that's creating the most conflict. All that glitters is not gold, so if someone is very brash and openly accusing others, chances are they're probably not a traitor, as they're flying too close to the sun. Just because you don't like someone does not mean they need to be banished or are lying. In fact, their decisions enable you to pick up valuable reactions from other players, so let them grill everyone else and you can reap the rewards of the risks they are taking. On the flip side of that, if you find yourself wanting to argue with others at the round table, never be rude. The knock-on effect of being unlikable is that people start thinking you're in it for yourself. They associate negative feeling with negative morality and start to suspect you. Always remain calm and respectful. Don't start cutting people off and don't snap back at people to let you finish too abruptly. Usually the person who comes across as the most aggressive and defensive gets kicked out, as the calmer person optically appears to be winning the argument by not being rattled. You don't have to be a robot, you can seem emotionally affected, but don't get angry or snide or vindictive, or it will cause people to see a bad side to you that they won't be able to forget. If you're entering the game with any allegiances, like a girlfriend, boyfriend or relative, Keep it to yourself, as any allegiance or click with another player is also likely to be cut apart by the traitors, so it's best to appear like you're a lone wolf. Plus, if the group find out later, the traitors will use that deception as evidence against you. We saw this explode in the UK's first season, when Tom foolishly revealed that he was actually Alex's boyfriend. This puts the unwanted spotlight on the couple, and it statistically feels likely that at least one of them is a traitor. The same can be said for revealing any kind of secret later in the game, like when Maddie needlessly admitted that she had professionally acted before. She originally didn't tell the group because she didn't want to be singled out, but by choosing to reveal it later, she looked even more guilty, as now that became the narrative of the day. So either keep no secrets or keep any allegiances under wraps until the very end. Strategically, it's a good idea to emotionally guilt the traitors about what they're doing, so that it weighs on their conscience more. 
as the end draws near, openly tell them how much it would hurt you if they turned out to be a traitor. Make them promise they won't betray you. Pile the pressure on and look for reactions. Let the liars feel the penalty of their social crimes so that they grow more anxious over time and become easier to spot. Because I swear to God, if I get that final tomorrow and there's a traitor in it, I don't. I don't know if I'll recover. As a faithful, don't just sit back and wait for the traitors to make their next move. If you do that, you're always going to be a step behind and in a state of reactivity. Instead, flip the script and set traps. We can find a perfect example of this in the US's second season, when Peter brilliantly tells three people he suspects are traitors that he got the shield, when in reality, Bergy has it. Dan is one of the prime suspects and nearly just got banished, so he should obviously avoid this bait as Peter specifically told him. But because his judgement is so clouded and he thinks he's better at this game than he is, he tries to eliminate Bergy, as Bergy already said he would vote for him tomorrow. So now when no one gets killed tomorrow, Dan is yet again going to be under intense scrutiny as he fell right into Peter's trap. So if you're a faithful, you should be setting up lots of little tests like this, having allegedly private conversations and seeing who that information trickles back to, when and why. One of the clearest ways to win as a faithful is to always look at who the most recently banished traitor voted for, as they'll usually leave a clue behind on their way out the door. It's rare for a traitor to get caught exclusively by faithfuls. Usually a fellow traitor has betrayed them, and perhaps was even leading the charge in order to take the credit for themselves. If so, always look at who that bitter traitor targeted on their way out the door, as there's no honour amongst thieves, they may have directly written down the name of their fellow conspirator. On top of that, always look at how the traitor gets banished. As thrilling as the UK's second season was, it is odd that no one ever questioned how Harry always seemed to know who the traitors were, and also managed to figure out their exact strategy and reveal it to the entire group on their way out the door. If we're being honest, he did overplay his hand at times, by being a little too clear-minded and certain of exactly what was going on. But somehow, his fellow contestants never even questioned how he never seems to miss whenever he goes really hard on someone. So as happy as you are to finally get a traitor out, don't revel in it too much. Instead, question the people that seemed to pants the hardest. And the final strategy is to befriend a traitor. As much as the traitors are potentially using your friendship to carry them to the finish line, you can also use them in the exact same way. Identify when someone is creating a tight bond with you that's a little too close, and begin to quietly suspect them. Never tell anyone else about it, even defend them from criticism so that you're sort of their useful idiot. But underneath that naive veneer, always have that quiet question mark hovering somewhere inside. This way, the traitor will keep you in the game longer as you're a useful pawn in their scheme. But when it comes to the final round and deciding who you can trust the most, Turn on them, question them, and if you have any lingering doubt whatsoever, eliminate them. Of course you might get it wrong, but you have to think about who has the most power and influence over you. Why are they so excited to stand there at the end with just you? Is it really your friendship, or is it so your personal bias will cloud your judgement and win them the prize? This is why The Traitors is such undeniably compelling TV, as it deepens our understanding of how manipulation actually plays out. Human beings are social creatures, we form interpersonal connections and move in packs in order to survive. It is our greatest strength, but also our most glaring weakness, as it makes us incredibly vulnerable to the power of suggestion. Ideas can snowball through a community faster than they can slow down. And despite what we might like to think, the truth isn't always obvious. You can piece together what looks like evidence to form a cohesive narrative, unaware that those breadcrumbs have been intentionally left out for you to follow, so that the closer you think you're getting, the further away you are. Or you can choose to simply trust your gut, conceding to the whims of your own personal biases and just hope that the people you happen to like the most are also the most honest. But one thing is for certain, if you are to win this game, you need to question everything. As often the person most likely to screw you over, is the person you least suspect. Well, 
If you've made it this far, firstly, thank you for watching, but if you could now give the video a like, possibly even leave a comment and click on that subscribe button, it will encourage that mysterious algorithm to do its thing.